ओम ज्ञान चिमीरंधस्या ज्ञानं जनशलाकाय चक्षुरं मिलितं येन तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः आई बीन टॉकिंग अबाउट हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस एसी भक्तिवेनंत स्वयं प्रोपाद who mercifully brought the message of krishna consciousness to the western world specifically about what was it about you need this light on if not necessary turn it off specifically what it is about him that was so attractive to so many people that they changed their life in as many respects as possible um in a beneficial way uh of course it's his message that is the most important uh, there are many personality cults but in many cases there's not much of a message or any message behind it it's just a personality cult and that's all uh, shila prabhupad was certainly a uh, an an attractive personality and he didn't just bring his message he brought himself which might sound like a truism but if we consider who he is how he affected people well that's the whole topic of this discussion um he could have given his message just given formal talks spoken but that wouldn't have the same effect as what he actually did his mingling with people the way he dealt with them um it wasn't that he was deliberately trying he went to some course on how to what is that how to make friends and influence pe- people there's some book called that that was the uh mother of all these courses and books that came out later the, the big winner in recent times has been that seven habits of highly successful people is it so it's all about this be nice to others and they'll be nice to you and then we'll all live happily that's the illusory idea behind all these things because everyone has to die <laughs> life's tough and then you die bumper sticker <laughs> uh <clears throat> but what is actually the uh, apart from being superficially nice to others and all this kind of personality development and all this uh, the first things we, we should understand is who we are what are we doing in this vast universe in which we are just an in- not to speak of us individually the whole planet is just an insignificant dot in a massive universe so what's it all about is is there something beyond this so shila prabhupad gave this uh, timeless message of the vedas spiritual knowledge that we are all eternal living beings we are mm, inextricably linked with krishna the supreme attractive person uh, largely misrepresented under the name of god in the uh, western world Uh, and Shila Prabhupada gave practical experience of that. So his uh, personality is, uh, in some ways, as important as his message, because uh, just like you might have a uh, a missile or or an, an, an explosive device, or in more what. we call primitive cultures we might have a big rock which we want to land on the heads of our enemies but we also need some without a means to deliver it uh without a missile to deliver the explosive or a, a catapult or whatever to deliver the rock uh then it the purpose won't be fulfilled so shila prabhupad was the medium through which this message of krishna consciousness was delivered analogous at the present time we could say in a very small way to uh Jesus or Buddha their personalities or the the stories of their personalities have uh influenced 
literally millions of people over uh, many generations. There's some doubt among scholars as to whether all those stories are true or if they even existed. Once, once someone's been uh, passed away for many, many generations, then people will doubt if you even exist. There's some doubts that Jesus even existed. So, But uh, the stories that are told or things that are said about him and about Buddha, they um, may or may not be true according to s- scholars uh, who we may or may not believe. Uh, similarly with Srila Prabhupada, um, we are finding even in the short time, 30, 37 years since he passed away, that already the mythology about him is beginning um, due to wishful thinking is one thing. Another thing is uh, that stories tend to get distorted as they're passed around. People add things, drop out things, and it gets changed. There's some psychological experiment in which uh, there are a group of people sitting in a circle and one whispers into the other some short anecdote and then they whisper into the ear of the next one and, and see what it comes back to the person who originally spoke it, if it comes back in the same way. Uh, but we do have much information about uh, what Srila Prabhupada said and did and where he went and we have many recordings, we have his books so there is a large body of um, material to try and understand him but then we can't understand him just by studying like entomologists study butterflies <laughs> This uh, living, spiritual, vibrant personality cannot be understood simply by some academic analysis. So, getting on with what I'm talking about, getting to the subject matter, actually. Yesterday I just mentioned how uh, several disciples of Srila Prabhupada's, they recalled the thrill, the spiritual ecstasy they experienced from touching Srila Prabhupada's feet. Uh, This act is uh, very much part of the culture of, uh, the traditional culture of India in what is called Hinduism, and it's also there in Jainism and Buddhism and Sikhism, which grew out of that, and probably among the Parsis also. Um, even in Bangladesh, I saw many times that although the uh, majority population is Muslim, I, I would say among the Muslims also, they would uh, touch the feet of their elders, uh, although that's probably proscribed in strict Islam. But the culture is there of symbolically by touching the feet Positioning oneself as subordinate, so this may not be very popular in the Western culture where the idea is that everyone's equal, at least we start off equal, and then if you can get ahead, that's up to you, but we're all start off with the, on the same, uh, on the same basis, but in uh, Vedic culture, it is accepted that there is hierarchy, and actually there's hierarchy everywhere even if we even if we try to say that everyone's equal and it's not possible to live without a hierarchy uh, so this uh, touching the feet is a sign of respect and usually one of not just respect but uh, great affection also it's uh, certainly yeah, certainly not part of Western culture and something that in Western culture uh, many people would feel upset about. Why Why are you touching someone's foot? Why, why are you showing so much deference to someone else? 
But the understanding is there that the mercy of God comes down. We can't just, by our penances or our prayers, force God to uh, come before us. Some people say, show me God, as if he's uh, some item. If you go into the shop and pay five euros, you can get something. So just by your demand, show me God. But rather he will reveal himself and he reveals himself through his devotees. So touching the feet, it is a sign of great deference and many devotees uh, reported feeling great ecstasy in doing so. Why is that? If if we study from a purely hard-headed, cold-hearted, so-called scientific, uh, objective perspective, it's just one body coming in contact with another. And why, why should there be any special feeling touching someone's foot? But it's the symbolism that is there, that the accepting oneself or projecting oneself, that I am subservient to you. Srila Prabhupada, as the guru of his disciples, he translated the word and often used the word spiritual master. Now, we may think that spiritual means you become completely uh, amorphous with no particular personality, but it's exactly the opposite message that Srila Prabhupada gave, this idea that everything is all ultimately all one, but rather that we are eternal, discrete individuals and we all have our eternal relationship with Krishna, who is the supreme, attractive, supremely powerful person. So to accept that position means to be situated in one's original position of ultimate bliss. We're all meant for bliss. We're not meant for struggling, which is the nature of this world. But we're meant to live in the spiritual world with Krishna. But that requires accepting what should be obvious, the reality of the situation, that we are tiny, tiny, tiny living beings. We are subordinate, ultimately, to God. And lucky for us, God is our uh, well-wisher. And he manifests himself through his great devotees, like Srila Prabhupada. Not that Srila Prabhupada is God, or that he claims to be God, but as the representative, he is imbued with the uh, love of God, with the energy of God, the power to uh, spread that to others. So to place oneself as his subordinate uh, makes a lot of sense because uh, we need shelter, we need guidance. Uh, as long as we think, I'm independent, I did it my way, then... Uh, we are simply tossed about within the material world from one body to another, one situation to another, uh, with no respite. Um, the next topic I'm going to talk about is the his personal presence. Now, Srila Prabhupada often taught that the guru is to be served in two manifestations. One is called Vani, his instruction, and the other is the Vapu, the personal form. So of these two, the Vani is most important. The personal form will not stay forever, nor can one always have access to that, uh, the Vapu, the personal body. But the Vani, the instruction, that remains, and even uh, if even... During the time of his personal presence, most of his disciples uh, spent very little time with him. Uh, that's just inevitable. But they could all live with him under his shelter by his instructions. So if we follow these instructions, then we live in the spiritual atmosphere. They're very simple instructions, uh, although for many people it may seem difficult to follow, that of uh, rising early, 
uh, keeping physically clean, uh, bathing regularly, and uh, most important, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, hearing about Krishna so that we can understand who is Krishna, what is our relationship with him. Uh, these are the activities of Krishna consciousness that Srila Prabhupada instructed us in. But nevertheless, his personal presence had, uh, as I read some examples, uh, a tremendous effect on people. And, of course, that's not true only of Srila Prabhupada. There are many <clears throat> saintly persons, by simply by coming into the presence of uh, many people, they experience, they have an experience which they never experienced before. Uh, I read some time ago about... Um, just one anecdote about this uh, Chandrasekhar Endran, who was a, who uh, he passed away some years ago. He was the uh, head of the Shankara Mutt in Kanchi, uh, uh, Mayavadi, full Mayavadi. But uh, in his habits, a uh, a very saintly person, a pure sannyasi in uh, in all respects. So. Um, one person who had translated into English the book about him or that I was reading uh, narrated one anecdote about how he practically dragged his brother-in-law to see that Swami. That Swami who uh, dressed uh, very simply as all the previous Shankara, Shankaracharyas before him did. Um, and this brother-in-law, due to the cajoling of his brother-in-law, uh, uh, came, and he deliberately came dressed in full finery, suit, tie, as if to show that, well, I'm a very sophisticated man of the world. I don't have anything to do with you useless people, parasites, living off the, living off others, just dressed in some rags. That was his attitude. He came in very proudly. With it. it looked like he was getting ready to chastise that person. He was a first-class atheist, in other words. So um, when he came into the presence of this uh, Swami, he just stood for a second and then he just fell on the floor, crying. And his whole life changed just by seeing that here is, uh, here I am so proud and here's a person completely free of any pride or egoism. He's, he won't, even if I shout at him, he won't be disturbed. Uh, even if I hate him, he won't reciprocate with that. And, and he just changed just by seeing him. And uh, there's a similar anecdote, not exactly. Um, there was uh, one Maharaj during the, this was during the time of Bhaktisiddhanta Sar Thakur, Maharaj of Burdhaman. This was during the, yeah, during the time of the British rule. This would be in the 1930s or like late 1920s. Uh, he regularly used to visit Bhaktisiddhanta Sar Sar Thakur. And as is the etiquette, even though he was a big king, this Maharaj would bow down before Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur whenever he went to see him. Then at one time he recounted, he said that, well, I thought that I'm the Maharaja bird one. I'm, I'm famous throughout Bengal, throughout India. I'm a, I'm a very respected person. Uh, why should I bow down to anyone? I'm, uh, so he thought that next time I go to see Saraswati Thakur, I won't bow down, and I'll just see what response he has, because uh, that is the normal etiquette when going to see a saintly person. One should bow down before him. So this Maharaja Bhardhaman, he <coughs> recounted that, so he went, next time he went to see him, visited him in Calcutta, and he walked in and he thought, no, uh, and now I'll, I'll just stand up and see what 
what, what, what is the look on his face? So he said, I walked in and I couldn't do it. My head just went down. I couldn't keep it up. I had to go down. <laughs> the power of the personality of Bhakti Stansar Thakur. What is that power? He wasn't trying to be powerful. He, he wasn't thinking, how can I be powerful? But he was naturally full with all spiritual power because he was full of Krishna <clears throat> and full of the desire to give Krishna to others. So he became empowered by Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada's personal presence. Hi Griever, I've quoted several times. Uh, he was uh, one of the biographers of uh, <coughs> probably to date the, um, the uh, most complete biographer of Srila Prabhupada in those early days in uh, New York and San Francisco. Uh, he wrote, We sense in his presence, Srila Prabhupada's presence, that indefinable something, elusive, magnetic, unique, majestic. Uh, from some time later, uh, there's a description of Vasudev Das, from Germany. This is from the book about Srila Prabhupada and his disciples in Germany. Uh, his description of his first time seeing Srila Prabhupada at Frankfurt Airport. So he recounted, the role of the spiritual master wasn't clear to me. Jai Govinda had brought a painting of Prabhupada from India, but there he looked so thin and sick that I had difficulty appreciating his transcendental qualities. My mundane concept of Prabhupada's external features dissolved when I saw him at the airport. As soon as he came through customs, everything seemed to be illuminated by the golden hue of his shining face and by his saffron-colored robes. As Prabhupada approached us, he didn't seem to walk, but almost dance, giving the impression that he was floating over the ground. We offered obeisances and continued to chant, and his smile indicated that he was pleased with our effort to give him a, to give him a befitting reception by just chanting the holy name. So there are several devotees in that book about Srila Prabhupada in Germany recounted their first time seeing him at the airport. They all remembered after thirty thirty years or so. It was such an experience for them. This point about Srila Prabhupada seeing to float. Although, in terms of his message, it's not very important. Uh, we're not so much concerned with miracles and all this kind of thing as genuine spiritual experience, uh, genuine submitting ourselves to he who is to be submitted to, to Krishna. Um, there is an anecdote which... Um, my one godbrother, Satya Narayan Prabhu, he told myself and others many, many years after it had taken place because he didn't want to say it to others. He said that when Srila Prabhupada arrived at Detroit, at the airport, he was the devotees met him at the top of an escalator. He was coming up an escalator and Satyanarayan said that he saw Prabhupada when he came up the escalator. Normally you come up and then the escalator goes straight and you go. But Srila Prabhupada kept on going up. And he was above the ground for some time before he came down to it. And Satyanarayan said, I didn't tell it to anyone else because I thought maybe it's just something that I saw. Maybe I was mistaken. But it struck him and it stayed in his mind that Srila Prabhupada was actually not touching the ground. He was walking, but he was just above the ground. But then he heard from uh, Indra Jumna Swami recount that he had seen the same thing. So then it was uh, confirmed. So again, it's not the most important thing. We're not so much concerned with miracles, uh, so-called or whatever may be called miracles. But uh, there is no doubt that in... 
many ways, Srila Prabhupada was a most extraordinary person. Mm. Um, this point about him shining, Hare Nama Ananda, um, he wrote about Srila Prabhupada. He was, uh, Hare Nama Ananda was uh, taking photos of Srila Prabhupada. Um, so he had set the camera so that it was, had a, this is before these days of present day, it's all highly sophisticated cameras, but in those days, settings had to be done manually. So it, because it was a little dark, the uh, place where Harana Amananda was to photo Srila Prabhupada, he set, he made the light settings accordingly so that uh, more light would come in than in an average setting. So he described, Harana Amananda described that he was looking to the, through the camera's viewfinder, uh, with the camera pointing at Srila Prabhupada, and to my great surprise I noticed that everything was much brighter than usual. A quick glance at the ceiling confirmed that the lighting was the same. No additional bulbs had been put in. So I wondered, what's the matter? Same film, same lights. Then I looked at Srila Prabhupada and saw that he was radiant, as if a golden effulgence were emanating from him, which actually physically brightened the room. And there are, there are many instances of that, of... Uh, Srila Prabhupada actually shining, that people who have such vision, they can see auras. So, just like we say someone, they have the blues, it means they're depressed. Well, actually, if someone is depressed, then their aura, the effulgence around them will be blue, green with envy, red with anger. It doesn't just mean the face becomes red, but... The, the aura, the subtle light becomes red. So, and if one is in very pure consciousness, free from lust and greed and anger and personal desire and always thinking of Krishna, then the aura will be golden. As in the uh, Christian tradition, we see that the halo is painted around the head, uh, but actually goes all around the body. So often Srila Prabhupada literally uh, light, brightened the room just by his very presence. Uh, in the temple in Hamburg, a devotee remembers sitting right in front of Prabhupada and observing his fingers while he was playing a harmonium. And he said, now that you could say is a very ordinary experience. Of course, here in the Western world, it's not a very ordinary experience to sit in front of someone playing a harmonium, but it's not something that would be reported in the newspaper uh, or shown on TV. That it's, it's a relatively ordinary event. One person is sitting playing a musical instrument and someone is sitting in front of him. But the devotee remembers, uh, he stated that in such a, a unique and intimate situation, I felt completely in another world. Why should that be? Well, that's because Srila Prabhupada is in another world. He's not of this world. He's in this world, but not of it. Uh, then again, this, this, most of these quotes here are from this book, uh, Srila Prabhupada and His Disciples in Germany. Uh, 50 to 70 devotees went to the Orly airport to receive him. That's in Paris. They went from Germany to Paris. Uh, many devotees, uh, they describe how Prabhupada, in so many, he stood out from the other passengers in the airport. Well, by his dress he would stand out, and probably by the fact that he, his skin was dark colored, which wasn't very common in those days in Paris. Now in some parts it's uh, uncommon to find anyone with what we call white skin, which isn't really white. Uh, but Srila Prabhupada stood out in other ways that 
all the all the others what one devotee described that all the other people in the airport they were just like one gray mass just a mass of people just like just like if you see a, if you're in a busy street in a lot of people and you don't you don't really see individuals you just see a a, a gray said gray because mostly people dress in darkish colors but this devotee said that Srila Prabhupada stood out like as if he was luminous amidst a gray mass of uh, inconsequential people. In, in contrast to the other passengers who appeared to me like shadows, Prabhupada seemed to be the only real person. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's, very telling observation, isn't it? That Srila Prabhupada was a real person. Now, of course, philosophically, we understand that everyone is a real person. But at the same time, in material existence, our personality is so covered that our real personality doesn't come through. We're all pale. We're all washed out. and Whatever emotions we have, whatever thoughts we have, they're all, everything is uh, made gray. It's like going from a color picture to a black and white picture. The forms are still there, but there's a major dimension is missing. So Srila Prabhupada is a fully developed person. These personality development courses the real personality development course is chanting Hare Krishna and taking to Krishna consciousness. Then our real person becomes personality becomes manifest. Otherwise, we're just wandering under the modes of material nature. And what we think is my personality at present, that uh, will change in another life. In one life, a person may be very shy. In the next life, he may be very... Uh, outgoing, one life may be a fox, uh, a dog, so it changes. But our real personality becomes manifest, and it's intense, because the the pure soul has the same qualities as Krishna. Not to the same extent as Krishna, but uh, to the extent that he can interact with Krishna. That means... He has to be a fully charged personality. So Srila Prabhupada was fully Krishna conscious and this devotee stated his spirituality was palpable and distinguished him from everyone else around him. Srila Prabhupada's bright eyes were glancing mercifully upon a uh, the assembled devotees, and at the same time he emanated deep humility. That's another uh, seeming paradox about Srila Prabhupada, uh, that at once he was majestic, commanding, aristocratic, very clearly the spiritual master of his disciples, and actually of the whole world. It's just that some people accept it and others don't but he is quite fit to be the spiritual master of the whole world but one of the uh, if not the major qualification for him being the spiritual master of the entire world is his deep humility clearly uh, humble so it is it's a seeming paradox but as in Krishna all apparent contradictions are reconcilable so also in the personality of a pure devotee. Um, then, continuing the description of Srila Prabhupada arriving in the airport, uh, there, there are many such descriptions of Srila Prabhupada's airport arrivals. There was a, a major event when Srila Prabhupada came to his place and his disciples would come out in... Uh, Marnida Prabhu explained to some extent the other day. Now devotees would 
just go wild and forget that there were members of the public present and just to greet Srila Prabhupada was a highly emotional experience which struck so many uh, non-devotees also. They couldn't imagine what was going on. They had no... The, the, the security personnel, they did, the, the airport authorities, they, they didn't know what to do. They'd, there's no training in, they, they're trained to do their job of, of, uh, supervising the, the airport, but no one trained them how to deal with 150 Hare Krishna devotees singing, dancing, banging drums, and without the slightest concern about what the airport authorities or about what anyone else might be thinking. That didn't come in their training, their training course. Although nowadays, at least I know at Bhaktivedanta Mana for many years, the, the, uh, cadets in the Metropolitan Police, the London Police, they all have to visit Bhaktivedanta Mana. Uh, not only the Mana, but they, many such places, because to give them more, uh, Cultural exposure, because London is uh, culturally highly multifaceted, and uh, the police have to deal with all kinds of people. Hopefully, with the devotees, uh, they'll be dealing with them in a uh, uh, favorable way. What do we say? In a, What's the term? Well, not, not going to arrest them as criminals, that I want to say. So as soon as Prabhupada appeared, the atmosphere became charged with emotion. The mass of devotees sung kirtan at the arri- sung kirtan at the arrival hall. Many, de- uh, when Prabhupada saw the disciples, he smiled and waved. Upon seeing him, all the devotees threw themselves flat on the floor in two lines to offer obeisances. One devotee describes the experience. I was so overwhelmed seeing Prabhupada in person for the first time that I immediately fell to the ground and offered obeisances. I laughed and cried simultaneously. My body trembled and within a few seconds I experienced all kinds of contradictory emotions. These are the kind of emotions that are described in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita and Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu as the emotions of devotees on the highest level of love of God. And Srila Prabhupada inspired that even in neophyte devotees. There is another anecdote of Shruti Kirti Prabhu who uh, traveled with Srila Prabhupada. He and Hari Shari Prabhu were two of the uh, longest standing personal servants of Srila Prabhupada. It's not a service that many devotees were able to do for a very long time. Srila Prabhupada was very intense. His schedule was uh, intense, uh, traveling so much, and um, not much sleeping. A lot of menial service, which you might think, well, that's very nice to do to a pure devotee, but uh, as Satsuru Maharaj described in that book, Life with the Perfect Master, it can be difficult to do menial service day in, day out, even if you're doing it for the spiritual master of the whole world. And uh, also Srila Prabhupada himself was highly intense. I mean, little mistake and a lot of, is liable to invite upon oneself a lot of chastisement from Srila Prabhupada. And he was, he wanted things done in a very proper way, down to the smallest detail. There's a description of how he tra- Yamuna Devi, she described how Srila Prabhupada trained her in cleaning so that she, she would spend some more than an hour each day cleaning Srila Prabhupada's room. Once in Vrindavan, Srila Prabhupada came from his walk and said, so I didn't train you in cleaning? And she, she wondered what she'd done wrong and Srila Prabhupada opened uh what was it? There was a, I can't remember exactly, something inside a box, a pen, maybe in a holder, and he opened it up and there was a little sliver of dust on it. And it was inside a container. Srila Prabhupada so, right? You didn't learn properly how to clean. She'd cleaned everything immaculately, but one tiny thing, 
she had missed and Prabhupada didn't miss it. Uh, so with Sruta Kirti, he related that once he said to Srila Prabhupada, you see, every time we come to an airport, all the devotees are jumping and singing and expressing such love for you. And I must admit that I don't feel that. I just walk down this, the ramp with you and carry your your things. And uh, I, I don't feel that ecstasy. It is uh, I like it as if to say, I'm missing something. So Srila Prabhupada said, well, do you like to serve me? And he said, yes, Prabhupada. He said, well, that's real love. And he, Srila Prabhupada said that, that uh, singing and dancing, that's all right, but the, the day in, day out serving, that is uh, real expression of love. Even more than jumping and dancing and singing and banging drums and so on. I often give the example, maybe it's a bit of an antiquated example uh, for the modern world, that if a man comes home after working all day, he comes home in the evening and his, his wife says, Oh! Wonderful, you're back. I love you so much. You say, well, that's very nice. Mostly wives won't do that. Um, but he might say, well, that's very nice. Okay, and then he comes in and sits down and says, okay, uh, what's for dinner this evening? Well, uh, I didn't cook any dinner. There's no dinner. But I love you. So she doesn't, actually in Indian culture, the husband and wife never say to each other, I love you like this. But it's just expressed by the action. So, the fact that she brings him his dinner every day, that expresses the love. Not that she said, I love you, I love you, I love you, but then she doesn't serve. So, uh, this point, I'm just giving this imaginary anecdote to uh, exemplify that point that uh, love is better expressed by uh, steady, selfless service day in, day out than it is by uh, any emotional effusion if that emotional effusion is not backed by steady service day in and day out. Uh, but anyway, that effusion was remarkable and it wasn't something that was staged it was uh, the natural outpouring of emotions of devotees who were undertaking many difficulties on Srila Prabhupada's order and because Srila Prabhupada wanted that. Uh, devotees would think, I'm doing this for Prabhupada. Uh, even the basic activities of Krishna consciousness, although in many ways very simple, were very difficult uh, for most of Srila Prabhupada's followers, rising early in the morning, following a disciplined regimen, and what to speak of, going out and distributing books, which is a very, very difficult thing to do, but devotees were doing it because they thought, we're doing this for Prabhupada. And when they s actually saw that person to whom they dedicated their life, then uh, naturally the... Uh, the uh, emotional response was overwhelming individually, collectively. It wasn't that anyone, it wasn't choreographed that someone said to them, okay, devotees, now it's time to start crying and falling on the ground. But uh, it, it just was spontaneous. Um, even devotees recall, even after many, many years, some very small details. The, the, the whole, the whole experience of being in Srila Prabhupada's presence made such an, eff an effect on them that they could remember small details. Now, at every moment, we're seeing something and hearing something and feeling something, but we don't remember it all. Just like I'm, to, for this example, I'm looking at. Aravind Prabhu, he's sitting up very straight. Uh, but while I made a point to particularly notice that, um, Madame Mohan 
looks like he's in the bathroom. <coughs> uh, I <laughs> another one. I just did. I I just read yesterday. I read through one lecture of Prabhupada where he he said in the middle of a lecture he said sit cross-legged all of you. So that's something that Prabhupada wanted. <clears throat> so uh, yeah. So. Uh, details of what we see, we hardly remember. It may be somewhere deep, deep in the subconscious. Srila Prabhupada often gave that example, that if we ask someone what you took for breakfast three weeks ago, uh, no one will be able to say, unless they take exactly the same thing for breakfast every day. We forget. We forget so many details. There's the famous... Uh, Forgetting the wife's birthday scenario, which I saw in that, I flipped through that book, you gave me parenting, spiritual parenting or something, and there's something about missing the wife's birthday, but what's that got to do with Vedic culture anyway? Uh, <clears throat> so the, there's some things in that book which are a bit strange. Um, so uh, we forget most things, and we, we certainly we wouldn't expect to remember some some my, what might appear to be a minor detail of something that happened many years ago, but many devotees remember even the very small details of their personal interactions with Srila Prabhupada. And this would especially be true of devotees who had little association with Prabhupada, because those who had much association with Prabhupada, well, familiarity breeds contempt, even Maybe not contempt, but, uh, well, a sense of familiarity in which it becomes uh, for them quite a normal thing to be in Srila Prabhupada's presence. Anyway, an example of this. Um, one devotee remembered seeing Prabhupada for the first time at this airport in Paris, and he said that especially his hands caught my attention. They were fine and aristocratic. He was someone completely different from any other person I had ever seen. And that that impression struck so many people, especially his disciples. My uh, analysis of this is that when Srila Prabhupada was present... There were certainly uh, senior devotees in our movement, and there were the there were big devotees and small devotees. But it was something like this: someone like me, I was a very small devotee, something like this. And there were big devotees who were much above us, very senior. But then, in comparison to Prabhupada, he was like a great mountain. And in comparison to him, we, we were like being big ants and small ants because Prabhupada was clearly so much above us. That's perspective I had. Uh, another devotee remembers, when I saw Srila Prabhupada for the first time at the Paris airport, I didn't see anything special right away, but as he approached, I noticed tears in his eyes and when I bowed down to offer obeisances, tears also welled up in my eyes Later on, uh, at the temple in Paris during a kirtan, one devotee observed how Prabhupada's gestures affected the disciples. Uh, he was singing and playing the kartals with his eyes closed. Prabhupada, at first, was, looked very grave. We often see that, yeah, that Srila Prabhupada looks very grave, especially when he's uh, lecturing. How, however, uh, a small girl about five years old was dancing in front of Srila Prabhupada and then he suddenly saw her and his, his facial expression changed from being very grave to uh, having a big smile on his face. And when the devotees saw Srila Prabhupada smiling like that, one devotee uh, commented that 
it was as if the smile infused everyone with renewed energy and the force of the kirtan, the ecstasy of the kirtan increased tenfold. Uh, in England in 1977, Srila Prabhupada went there. He was uh, in a wheelchair. He could, uh, his movements were uh, no longer the young old man who would leap in kirtan. He, could, he was just moving very little. But the devotees, that time also, devotees had came from Paris and Germany and Holland and all different, uh, from all over Britain to see Srila Prabhupada, to be with Srila Prabhupada Bhaktivedanta Mana. So the kit, during the Guru Puja, the kirtans were going on, full force. And then, this was described to me, I wasn't there. I, I left shortly before that to go and stay in India. <laughs> uh, I saw Srila Prabhupada in India just before he went to England. Um, and devotees described that they were jumping with great energy and ecstasy. And then Srila Prabhupada, he, he couldn't move much, but just indicated with one hand, like like this, just, as if to say, jump more. And then the devotees were already leaping. They, 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 somehow or other, they leaped higher and higher. Just a little indication was... Uh, gave Srila Prabhupada, the, by Srila Prabhupada, gave them the impetus to dance more and more. And uh, the devotees were going out on book distribution and doing more book distribution than they'd ever done before because they were so inspired by Prabhupada's presence and they wanted to please him so much. Um, just something tangential here, but important. I, on the day of Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa Puja celebration. I believe it was Adbhuta Hari who said this. One of the devotees said it. I don't remember who, you see. This memory is uh, tricky. <laughs> uh, he said that nowadays it's very difficult to make even one devotee. Does anyone remember him saying that? You said that. Uh-huh, okay. All right. Um... Okay, it's true, but would it be so difficult if we did what we used to do? People joined as devotees because we used to regularly go out on Harinam Sankirtan. We used to go out and distribute many books. We we had an atmosphere in the temples. It wasn't that everyone was fully surrendered, but there was a push like that, that everyone should fully surrender. Uh, you could. There was a strong preaching mode. Uh, maybe it was somewhat fanatical or naive or immature, but people became devotees. The, the whole atmosphere that was generated by that was so attractive that many people wanted to be part of that. Nowadays, we more have the approach that, well, if you like, it's okay. Uh, and many people think, well, I don't like that much. <laughs> uh, uh, if there's not that much difference between, if, if we're just nice people, well, there's so many nice people in the world. Uh, but the, the sense of urgency and this, this missionary spirit, that uh, attracted people to join. So it is very difficult to make, to convince people to join nowadays. But I'm just wondering that if we, if we did what we used to do, and uh, then we might be more successful. We have so many plans for spreading Krishna consciousness. I said this to one god brother who is making so many different programs and new approaches for spreading Krishna consciousness. I said, Why don't you just stick to the old thing? Uh, you're saying that we can't spread Krishna consciousness. We're not making devotees. Well, why why don't you promote Harinam Sankirtan, book distribution, festivals, the, the program that Prabhupada gave us and see the result before you go into all these different strange things that Prabhupada never introduced. Just a thought. Hare Krishna. That's all for now. Uh, to be continued tomorrow, Krishna willing. 
Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Shri Shri Gauranitai ki jai. Shri Shri Radha Govinda ki jai. Samavita Bhakta Vrinda ki jai. Hare Krishna.